So I'll let me start with a prayer, yes? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, we thank you for this day and all the ways that you're working in our lives. We ask your blessing upon this conversation, this talk, this class, this evening, and upon us. Please help us to appreciate to uh, all that you've given us, especially in the gift of your Son. Uh, we ask uh, for the grace to believe, grace to love, grace to understand, uh, to believe what is true, to be, have our hearts and minds conformed uh, to the truth so we can love you. Uh, we ask all this through Christ our Lord, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So as you can see, we're going to talk about the big question, is Jesus of Nazareth, this guy who walked around, is he actually God? Because if that's true, all these other religions may have portions of the truth, but if they don't have Jesus, they don't have the very center of everything. They don't have the very foundation of everything because they don't have God coming to earth and walking around. We've talked about, there we go. So we've talked about a couple of these five key questions. Is there truth? We've gone through that, yes. It does God exist? We've gone through various proofs. Obviously, there's lots more proofs of God's existence, a lot more we could say. Uh, but we've gone through some of the proofs. Now, we're skipping over temporarily this question of is there revelation? We'll come back to it in a few weeks. Because I think this question really answers the other one. It's an important question, has God revealed stuff, uh, because there's lots of religions or philosophies out there that would say, no, he hasn't, the creator of the universe hasn't, hasn't uh, done anything, and I think one of the ways you get to that question is, well, did God just come to earth, because that, that would be a revelation, right, that would be the revelation, and then we'll talk next time about, did Jesus Christ start the Catholic Church, and uh, we, had, we had last time, or a couple times ago, G.K. Chesterton's response, you know, the difficulty of explaining why I'm Catholic is that there are 10,000 reasons, all amounting to one reason, that Catholicism is true. You know, we're going to start with these core questions, even though there's lots and lots of other questions, lots of other, other reasons, because this is how you kind of narrow down, in my opinion, all religions down to Catholicism uh, by dealing with these, these core questions. Right? And then we'll get into a lot more details. So, something that anybody, whether they're a believer or not, could say is that Jesus Christ is the most influential person in the history of humanity. I think that's a pretty basic claim, right? Two billion people claim to follow him. He's the most influential figure in the hu history of the human race. And so, we could then follow that. Jesus being God, which is what Christians believe, Catholics believe, is either the greatest truth or the greatest deception ever to come upon the human race. It's either amazing, God came to earth, or somehow, a guy 2,000 years ago has tricked billions and billions and billions of people. Or people 2,000 years ago have tricked billions. Right? It's either the greatest truth or the greatest lie. Obviously, you know what I already believe, greatest truth. So, so we're going to look at this again from the kind of rational side first. What do we know? Is this, this is what we talked about with faith and reason, right? Uh, we're not just going to say, you need to believe this because you'll go to hell if you don't. We're going to say, we've got to believe this because it's true, right? And yes, salvation is offered through Jesus Christ. We should believe it because it's true, not out of fear, because out of, but out of truth. So we know we can prove God exists. And so there are two options, really. Either the all-powerful, perfect God created the world, but has not interacted with it, like a clockmaker that just starts things and leaves it, leaves it alone, which is called deism, that there is a God that he's completely separated from the world. And I think that's irrational. It's like giving a laptop to a caveman. Right? Imagine God creating this world, creating a very complicated, beautiful, amazing world. We're very complicated beings, from our thoughts to the very cells, DNA. Imagine him... Imagine giving a cat cave, laptop to a caveman and not telling him what's it for. He's going to be like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> go, go, go. <laughs> you know, he's going to destroy that thing before he ever realizes what it's for. Right? It's not very nice. It's not very nice. Right? Uh, you would, you, would you give keys to a toddler, to your car? No. 
So, all-powerful God creates a world, creates a world for a purpose, but doesn't say what that purpose is. I'm not telling you. Good luck figuring it out. <laughs> that doesn't seem like a very logically good thing. It doesn't seem like a good plan. And so, or, the all-good God created the world and has interacted with us, spoken to us, and acted in the, in the world in some way. Right? That seems more logical. We're going to go through how we know that that's actually what happened. Uh, but we can at least say that deism doesn't really seem all that coherent of a system. God creates this world, creates us, but doesn't tell us anything. Why? It's not like he would need anything. It's not like he's bored. It's not like he's like, ha, ah, I've just created reality television for myself and laugh at you silly humans. No, that would mean he needed something. He didn't need anything. Or, what if God not only spoke to us and acted in our lives, but actually came to earth, walked around, taken on our human nature, uniting himself to us? If that's true, it changes everything. And that would be really good, really beautiful, amazing. And we would have to respond. That would elicit a response. Or if God came to earth, said, this is God, this is the way, you got to either say yes or no to that. And I remember uh, when I was going through my own conversion, I was reading a book by Peter Kreef, Dr. Peter Kreef, who's a philosophy professor, a uh, great author, one of my favorites. It's a short book called The Journey. And it was my first philosophy book, I think, in, before I took philosophy. Uh, and in the book, there's a guy who's confused, right? He's trying to find his way. And he meets up with Socrates. It's a you know, fictional story. Meets up with Socrates, and Socrates like, takes him to different philosophical systems, like relativism. You know, and he gets into a whole argument of helping him see how relativism can't possibly be true, or agnosticism, or all these different, philosoph all these different philosophies. Eventually, I'll tell you the end of the book. Right? Father, spoiler alert! Catholic guy, I mean, it's, it's the journey. I think you know where the journey is going to, right? It's going to Jesus. So at the end of the toe, he gets, gets to a point where Socrates can't take him any further, and he meets up with Moses. Because right? so you've got to say, is there a God, is there not a God, and has he spoken to humanity? That's when philosophy ends and theology begins. Right? Philosophy can take you right up to Revelation, but, it's, not, but it's, it's all reason, right? Reason? Say, yep, makes sense that God would reveal it. It's purely, you know, it's rational, it makes sense. And then you got to choose, is the revelation. And then Moses leads him up to C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis leads him to the cross. C.S. Lewis is a Christian author. Uh, though he never became Catholic, wrote uh, some very Catholic things. Wrote about, you know, uh, believed in purgatory, actually. Uh, and so, leads him right to the foot of the cross and says, who do you say this person is? You have to make a decision. Every single person on the planet has to make a decision who Jesus of Nazareth was. To say, I don't know, is to make a decision. To say, I'm not going to think about that, is to make a decision. We have to make a decision. It's the central, most influential person in the history of the human race. Has affected more people than anyone else in history. And claimed to be God. But you have to make a stance on that. True or false? Okay, so, we have to respond. Jesus said some super intense things. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Right? Other religious leaders, other philosophical leaders never claimed to be the way. They'd say, here's the way, or here's a way, or here's some ideas. And he says, I am the way. He claims to be the answer himself. Right? Muhammad didn't do that. Buddha didn't do that. All the major religions, no other major religious leaders that have any influence, right, except for maybe small cult leaders, no substantial religious leaders have claimed, no, I am the way. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And then he says it, I and the Father are one. And the Father are one. And that's either true or is blasphemy. Right? Because no one can claim that except God. I and the Father are one. An angel can't claim that. Not and mean it. The central center of Catholicism is Jesus Christ. The 
God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Sometimes when people think of Catholicism, they think, oh, Catholicism is just about a bunch of rules. You know, just do this, don't do that, don't do that, or you go to hell, don't do that, don't, don't do that. The very center of our religion is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Right? People will say, oh, but, you know, Father, I'm, I'm spiritual, not religious. What does that mean? It just means you're your own religion. Right? Religion is a set of beliefs about how to live, about how to live, how to relate to God. So it's a set system, and Jesus did establish a religion of how to relate to him. You know, there is a way, there is a truth, there is a life, and his name is Jesus Christ. Right? He is the center of, of Catholicism. Everything in Catholicism only makes sense when you see it as the goal is radical union with God. The goal is sharing in Christ's life. The goal is to take his life into ours, to conform our life, to follow him, to live as he lived, to participate in, the, in, the, in his mysteries. The goal of our life as Catholics is union with Jesus Christ, intimacy with him. And we would go even so far as to say, to be mystically married to him. Right? Heaven talks about, uh, the Bible talks about heaven being a wedding fe feast. A wedding feast between Christ and the church. Between the bridegroom, whom Jesus repeatedly calls himself, and the bride, the church. That God wants to wed himself to us. That God wants a union so profound it can only be described in marital terms. And obviously we have to take a stance on who this person is. If he is God, if he is the spouse of our soul, if he is the one for whom we've made, we've been made for, it changes everything. Okay. So, again, going back to kind of the rational looking at it, the key questions we've got to answer is, how do we know Jesus even existed? What if he was, some, some people think, oh, he's just a myth, he's just a nice story, right? You know. Did Jesus fulfill prophecies? Prophecies matter. Right? You can't control what happens before you're born? It can't be like, okay, 500 years before I'm born, say this about me, right? You're, you don't exist. Unless you're God and you do exist, then so prophecies matter. And that Jesus was prophesied about by many prophets over hundreds of years and given very specific prophecies that are too specific to be random. Right? It's not like a fortune teller, oh, you, you're sad about something. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Yes, I'm sad about something. You're, you're having difficulties in life. Wow, brilliant. You know, um, <clears throat> Does Jesus himself claim to be God? Right, people say, oh, it was a later invention. Jesus didn't think he was God. He just thought he was a teacher. Okay, let's look at that. Was it a later invention? And then are there miracles that verify his claim? And so we're going to look at all these things from a rational side and then Try to say, how does this, what does this mean about Jesus Christ for my life? So why do we believe in Jesus? Short answer is because of the Catholic Church. <laughs> may sound prideful to say, but I'll say it anyway. The world would not know about Jesus Christ without the Catholic Church. The world would not have the Bible. The world would not have any of it, right? Because Jesus started the Catholic Church. It reminded that we know about Jesus because of eyewitness testimony. Just like I know about anything 2,000 years ago, because people saw him, people spoke about him. You know, these are apostles, bishops, hundreds of disciples. They saw him crucified. They saw him risen from the dead. You know, these were the first members of the church. And if we use the same standards that we use in archaeology for any historical thing, any historical figure, we can know for certain that Jesus of Nazareth really existed. You look at how you figure out other historical documents. He is the most documented ancient figure in history compared to other people, compared to other histor historical figures like Alexander the Great or whatever. There's a massive amount of testimony. Okay. The disciples and apostles were eyewitnesses to all these things that really happened. You say, well, Father, there's no photos, there's no YouTube videos. We're like, well, duh, there's nothing, you know, that didn't exist 2,000 years ago. That's, it can't be the standard, right? Photos and videos can be faked anyway, so... And they were willing to die for this truth. None of the early disciples ever claimed it was a myth, even under extreme torture. 
Even under extreme torture, they didn't claim it was a myth, and even their enemies didn't claim it was a myth. Well, which we're going to see. So, we, and I think it's a, that matters. Our religion, again, is about a person who's real, who they had real contact with. It's not a nice story. It's not a nice belief system. This makes me feel nice. God came to earth. That changed everything. They saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. They heard him. They saw him work miracles. They saw him crucified. They saw him rise from the dead. They stuck his finger in his side. They saw him. He didn't just appear as some type of spirit or ghost. They saw him. And it says this in 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched our hands, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we saw it and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father. It was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing this that our joy may be complete. This is, at the center of this, is about a personal, actual, direct, profound relationship with Jesus Christ whom they saw, heard, talked with, ate with, hung out with, and experienced eternal life through him. It's not just following a bunch of rules. This is the radical pursuit and radical intimacy with a person, Jesus Christ. Three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, so what's the claim of non-believers? The claim of non-believers is that Jesus Christ never existed, right? That he was just a myth invented by others who were trying to get power, trying to get influence, whatever. So let's look at that. Let's, let's play it out. Okay, first question is when? When was the myth invented? There's only two options, before Constantine or after. If it was before, now Emperor Constantine was the one that legalized Christianity, made it legal at the Edict of Milan in 313 AD to be Catholic. Before this, they considered Catholicism treason. You don't worship the gods? You're an atheist. You don't worship the gods. You have your own little god. You don't worship the emperor. You won't burn incense to the emperor. You don't do it, we'll kill you. You don't acknowledge that Caesar is the Lord. You say, Jesus, this guy, Jesus is Lord, we'll kill you. It was illegal to be Catholic. They found out that you're a Catholic, they would kill you for 300 years. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that there's been times, and there are times right now, that sitting in this classroom would get you killed. Doing what you're doing right now would get you killed. That's intense to think about, right? Like, there's places where I can walk down the street like this and get shot, right now on earth. And you say, I believe in Jesus Christ. I love Jesus Christ. Someone will kill you. It was illegal to be Catholic and believe in Christ for the first 300 years. It's not a path to health and wealth and power, it was a path to torture. So if you're saying it happened before, why would you make up a myth that got you persecuted and killed? Right? People lie to get out of trouble. They don't lie to get into trouble. Definitely don't lie to be tortured. So you've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people lying in order to be tortured and, and killed? That doesn't make any sense. Christians may have given up the faith during torture. There's times where Christians okay, kept the faith, became great saints, martyrs of the church. Obviously in the history of the church times where people being tortured, they burned incense, they betrayed the faith, but they never claimed it was a big hoax. That's something the enemies of Christ would have noticed and written about repeatedly, and they don't. In fact, they write the opposite. So, or you say, well, so, so I'm saying Emperor Constantine created the myth of Jesus to give control, either Christ, to control Christians or to give them power. Again, 300s doesn't make sense. After the 300s, or before, after, before it was persecuted, after, say, well, that was Constantine that created all this myth. Constantine divinized Christ. Constantine made this Jesus of Nazareth, this carpenter, into God. But we have writings from the first century, before, long before Constantine ever existed, writing about Jesus of Nazareth, writing that Christians believed he's God. Of course, the Gospels themselves, eyewitness testimonies, four witnesses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of course, you have the writers of the New Testament, Paul, you know, and James, and John, and is it Luke, and Mark, well, I already said Mark and Luke, anyway, writings from other Christians in the first and second century, and we have non-Christian sources, people who are even anti-Christian, anti-Catholic, 
all before Constantine. So before Constantine, it doesn't make sense. You're not going to create a lie that's going to get you tortured. After, nope, can't be. We have writings before Constantine. Okay, so let's look at some of these. One of the texts that's not in the Bible, obviously we have the, the Bible, all written in the first century. And that's a lot of text. That's 26 letters and books and testimonies to Christ. 26. You know, written, it's not just, it, it's important to remember that the Bible didn't just fall from the sky, someone just didn't sit down one day and just write it all out. It was written by many different authors over hundreds and hundreds of years and put together by the Catholic Church. It was the Catholic Church that put the Bible, the, uh, the Bible together, what's called the canon of the New Testament, the list of books. Before they were just being copied, right? They didn't have printing presses, not for 1,500 years. They didn't have, if you wanted a copy of the text, you had to copy it or pay someone to do it, which was expensive. People always, like, uh, you'll say these, hear these comments, oh, the Catholic Church chained up the Bible. Uh, of course it did. For 1,500 years, there wasn't a printing press. We didn't want it stolen. What else do you do? <laughs> it's not like there's, you know, you got a safe, you got, you got to, if you have a text that's valuable, you believe it's the word of God, you don't want someone walking off with it, how do you secure it? You got to secure it in some way. That's not preventing people from reading the Bible. That's just keeping it from being stolen, <laughs> right? Chained it up, chained up the Bible. It's like, well, yeah, we lock our doors in our house. That's not you know, basic safety. So the Didache is a first century text. Uh, Didache is Greek for teaching, so it refers to the, the teachings of the apostles. And we see this reference. We give thee thanks, Holy Father, for thy holy name, which thou hast made to tabernacle in our hearts, to dwell in our hearts, and for the knowledge and faith and immortality which thou hast made known unto us through, through thy Son, Jesus. Jesus. And you go on and on and on. Read the whole Didache. Um, you can go to newadvent.org and read a lot of these early Christian writings, which are very beautiful. St. Ignatius of Antioch, one of my heroes, uh, who was martyred for the faith in 110 AD, was fed to the lions. He writes letters as he's being carried off, which is amazing. I highly recommend reading the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch. Dude was awesome. So one of the things he said in his letter to the Ephesians, Ignatius, also called Theophorus, to the church at Ephesus in Asia, predestined from eternity for a glory that is lasting and unchanging, united and chosen through, the tr through true suffering, by the will of the Father in Jesus Christ, our God. Okay. Died in 110. Died in 110. And so, not a later, 300 years later, 400 years later, Jesus Christ, our God. For our God, Jesus Christ, was conceived by Mary in accord with God's plan. Of the seed of David, it is true, but also of the Holy Spirit. And he, of course, writes this about this repeatedly. So I'm not going to go through every single thing that St. Ignatius says. I'm just going to quote several different sources. I'm uh, sorry if I sorry if I get this name wrong. Aristides or uh, Aristides, whatever. Christians are they who above every people on earth have found the truth. For they acknowledge God, the creator and maker of all things, in the only begotten Son, and in the Holy Spirit. So there you see Trinity. Trinity talked about 140 AD. Tatian the Syrian. We are not playing the fool, you Greeks, nor do we talk nonsense when we report God was born in the form of a man. 170. Now, so that we have many, of course we have all the New Testament writers, we've got several of these and many others from 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, all the way up to 2,000. We have non-Christian writers. So Josephus is a famous one. He was a Jewish historian who died in 98 A.D., and this is what he wrote about Jesus in the Jewish antiquities. Now, he's writing a history for the Roman Empire. You don't make mistakes. You don't make things up. This isn't a fictional work. This is the, this is the story of the conquered people that he's, gonna, he's writing. And you start throwing in errors, you're going to get killed. About this time arose Jesus, a wise man, who did good deeds and whose virtues were recognized. And many Jews and people of other nations became his disciples, Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. However, those who became his disciples preached his doctrine. They related that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Perhaps he was the Messiah, in connection with whom the prophets foretold wonders. And not claiming it's a myth, not claiming.
claiming he's Christian, but saying maybe he was. Maybe he was the Messiah, the one who was prophesied about. Claiming he was a historic person. Okay? We also have the historian Tacitus in 64 AD. Again, very early, 64 AD. Nero fastened the guilt on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. So Nero, uh, Nero blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome, which he did himself, he was responsible for, and started killing Christians left and right. And so he says this, Christus, for whom the name has its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate and of a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment, again broke out, not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but in Rome, even in Rome. Again, non-Christian, pagan, calling it a superstition, but not saying Jesus wasn't real. Right? Nope. He was real, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate. 64 AD, this guy was real. Pliny the Younger. Oh, anti-Catholic, but doesn't claim Jesus was a myth. Pliny the Younger, a pagan historian, writes to the emperor in 111 AD. They were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a god, and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to any wicked deeds, never to commit any fraud, theft, or adultery, never to falsify their word, nor deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up, after which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. He's a pagan. He doesn't know about the Eucharist. He's just talking. Again, what do you see? You see they're worshiping Christ as a god. This is not some later invention. You have Christians and non-Christians saying they're worshiping him as a god. And not claiming that he didn't exist. I know. More. Babylonian Talmud, a collection of Jewish rabbinical writings from 70 AD to 200 AD. On the eve of the Passover, Yeshu, Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus in, um, in uh, Aramaic, Yeshua. Uh, Yeshua was hanged. Forty days before the execution took place, a herald cried, he is going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. Again, these are obviously non-Christian sources. Lucian of Samosata, second century pagan satirist, someone who was making fun of people, the Christians worship a man to this day, the distinguished personages who introduced their novel rites and was crucified on that account. It was impressed on them by their original lawgiver that they are all brothers from the moment they are co- converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage and live after his laws. Again, not claiming he didn't exist. Okay, so what are the facts of history? We look at Jesus just on the level of science, reason, archaeology, like we would look at any historic figure, what evidence is overwhelming. Both Christian and non-Christian evidence for Jesus of Nazareth. Can't deny that he historically existed. Even the enemies of Christianity acknowledge he was real. We have evidence from the first century, not centuries later. There are no first or second century writings claiming Christians ever invented a Jesus character. Evidence from a time when Christians were being killed for this belief. Again, why would you make up a lie that would lead to your being persecuted, tortured, and killed. And why would your enemies support it and say, yeah, he existed? That makes sense. So historically, we know Jesus and Nazareth. Now, what about prophecies? So, Jesus never existed. He was made up by others. Busted. No, not, not how that works. The reason we, reason we know that Jesus was more than just a nice guy, a nice teacher who died a tragic death, more than just a good rabbi, was that he was prophesied about. For hundreds of years, by many different prophets in different areas, he was prophesied about. No one can control what happens hundreds of years before their birth. Prophecies prove Jesus was more than a man. At the heart of the Jewish faith, at the heart of Judaism, is the expectation of the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christus, the Christ. We see this All throughout the scriptures. I'm going to quote just a few, but there's hundreds, literally hundreds. Deuteronomy 18, 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Speaking of the Messiah, that's going to be the new Moses. In Micah 3, 1. Behold, I send my messenger to prepare the way before me. 
excuse me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of, the Lord of hosts. So not just a teacher, but the Lord is going to show up. And there's going to be his, his, his way is going to be prepared by a messenger, we know to be signed John the Baptist. Isaiah 9, chapter 9, things get really specific. For to us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of his peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. That this Messiah is going to be called Mighty God is going to establish a kingdom that's going to last to the end of time. Which we believe is Catholicism, Catholic Church. Other prophecies. You know, about, this is the prophecies in Isaiah 53, often called the suffering servant. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. This is hundreds of years before Jesus Christ walked the face of the earth. Hundreds of years. <coughs> and he's going to be the seed of a woman in Genesis 3.15. Hundreds and hundreds of years. Descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Judah in Genesis 49. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. Right? You can't control that. You can't control where you're born. But like, go, go, go. Mom, Bethlehem. You can't do that. Not happening. Born of a virgin. It's a miraculous thing. Way prepared by messengers. We already saw. It's going to enter into Jerusalem on a donkey. You know, there's hundreds and hundreds of prophecies about Jesus Christ. And he fulfills all of them. The statistical possibility of that is off the charts. You, like, there's people who have done the math, it's off the charts. You're more likely to win the lottery every time you play it than, than just to randomly fulfill these types of prophecies, just by random chance. And then we see different prophecies about his death. Right? Messiah's price money would be used to buy a potter's field, and it was. He'd be falsely accused, silent before his accusers, spit on and struck, hated without cause, crucified with criminals. He would be given vinegar to drink. His hands and feet would be pierced. The Messiah would be mocked and ridiculed. Soldiers would gamble for, his, for the gar his garments. And not a bone of his would be broken. These are all hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ. You're like, that's Jesus. Right? You can't control how you die. I mean, I guess you could try. But being crucified by, your, by the Roman his enemies? I mean, it's not like, like, okay, do this now. Make sure you gamble. For, like, they're not going to plot that. The Romans and the Jewish people aren't going to plot death in a way that's going to fulfill prophecy. They are killing him because they don't want him. They don't want him as Lord. They don't want him as Messiah. Right? All he had to be. All he had to do is say, "Guys, not the Messiah. Chill out. Just joking. Psych. You know." And they would probably let him go, beat him up, and let him go. But no. He claimed to be God. Claimed to be the Messiah. Claimed to be the Lord. And they crucified him. And so this is the big claim, you know, that was what Adam and Eve had lost, right? In Genesis, we saw this. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. You will strike at his heel and he will crush your head. Is it undone? Is the beginning of it being undone when the angel of the Lord appears to Mary and says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born of you and will be called Holy, the Son of God. He announces that she's going to Conceive and bear a son in the name of Jesus. And she says yes. And we see a, a, a reversal, right? A fallen angel appears to Eve, and she follows, she believes the fallen angel and brings death into the world, brings sin into the world. Now a glorified angel speaks to a new Eve. We often call Mary the new Eve. 
And she says yes to God and brings the Lord and giver of life into the world. We hear us say at times, Mary's yes undoes Eve's no. We know that Christ is referred to in the scriptures as the new Adam. The one, you know, we inherit sin from Adam and Eve. We inherit salvation through Jesus Christ. He's called the new Adam. Well, we can say Mary, analogously, is the new Eve. She's saying yes to bring this all about. Just as Eve said no. We'll talk more about Mary, of course, in upcoming days. And then we know the angel said to them, Be not afraid. Behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which come to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Right, the angels appear to the shepherds. The wise men see the star in the sky, and you can watch this movie called the Star of Bethlehem and nerd out on, on astronomy, what was going on in the sky at the time. This guy did all this stuff with, uh, with the modern technology that helps you plan out the night sky, any location on earth, and any time in history. And it goes through all this stuff, and it's like, well, that's pretty amazing. So, I won't do any spoiler alerts there, but you can watch the movie if you want. It's pretty cool. Star of Bethlehem is what it's called. Uh, but the angel appears to these shepherds, these outcasts, who are shepherding their flock at night. they got no stables, they're just outcasts. And gives them a real hope. Messiah's been born. They're not born in a castle, not born in a big palace with massive amounts of servants. He literally is homeless, has no place to lay his head. He's born in a... Born in a barn in a cave, equivalent of a barn back then, placed in a food trough, that's what a manger is, it's a food trough, around animals and poo and all sorts of stuff, he enters into real, the God of the universe enters into our radical poverty. We see angels, we see shepherds, we see wise men all coming to him. And then 30 years later, he begins his ministry. He lives like us in all things but sin, living a holy life as uh, a member of the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. But then the time comes, the time of prophecy being fulfilled goes to John the Baptist, the one that they thought, they thought he was the Christ. Are you the Christ? No. I'm the voice crying on the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. And then he sees, he baptizes Jesus, Jesus who is sinless, doesn't need repentance, but he's come to take on our sin. He's come to assume our humanity. And so he does this to fulfill all righteousness. He enters into our repentance, enters into the depths of our sins. And when he does, he says, Behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a low voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Whoa, wait, what, what, Son? Son? Oh, what's going on there? Who is this guy? And he doesn't just say, okay guys, I've come to teach you some things. No, he says, the time is fulfilled. All of it is fulfilled, right? He goes into a temple and says, these scriptures are fulfilled in your hearing. And they try to cast him off the cliff, right? Who are you? Who do you think you are? Time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Believe in the good news begins his ministry after being baptized by John, after being tempted in, the, in the, the desert by the evil one. And we know that he calls apostles to follow him, like Matthew, Peter, James, John, all the, apostles, all the 12 apostles. And they drop everything. Right? Goes to Matthew, a tax collector, which was not a popular job back then. Right? Not a not, not very well-respected person, right? Just, just like IRS would be today, right? You know, like, yay, you know, beloved person. No, the spy is seen as a crook, right? Goes to this person that the Jewish people would see as someone to be cast off, be ignored. This man called Matthew sitting at the tax office. He looked at him and said, follow him. And he rose and followed him. Just, all right. You see this with fishermen. No, he doesn't choose the best and the brightest. He doesn't choose those who excelled at rabbi school. He chooses average people, fishermen, tax collectors, people. Come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. 
And they're like, all right. Something about him moves them. And we know that he works mighty miracles, raises the dead, drives out demons, heals the sick, restores sight to the blind, heals persons of leprosy, walks on water, changes water into wine, and at the height of his ministry, he establishes a church, he establishes a kingdom. He says, when he says, who do people say that the Son of Man is? When he asks this question in Caesarea Philippi, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And the apostles are like, well, some say John the Baptist. Come back from the dead, you know. John the Baptist has already been killed. Some say John the Baptist. Others, Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And they go, okay, you're like, you're like some of these guys come back from the dead. And he says, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon, one of the apostles, says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. The son of the living God. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And so I say to you, you are Peter. He changes his name. That's a big deal, right? The times where God, only God changes people's names, right? We see this with Abraham. We see this with uh, Jacob becoming Israel, Abram becoming Abraham. We see this with Simon becoming Peter, which means rock. You're a Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth should be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth should be loose in heaven. This is a really important line for us as Catholics. Keys of the kingdom of heaven. You see this in scripture, and we'll talk more about this. The keys are some, just like they are now, symbolic of authority. You have keys. You've got authority over whatever you got. What do you got the keys for, right? You've got the keys of my car, which means I can drive the car. I've got an authority over the car. Keys to the house. Keys to the office. Right? I've got, I got the ability to run that, run that show. Keys to the kingdom of heaven, making Peter second in command, making him his prime minister. Keys to the kingdom of heaven, you have the keys, you're, you're in charge when the king's not there. And we see this, there's real power, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Peter says, guys, this is how it is. That's how it is. He says, guys, this is not how it is. That's how it's not. And we'll see that played out. We see that played out in Matthew 17, uh, where Peter binds did your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes. And Jesus paid, and so Jesus doesn't do anything because someone else says so. But yet, when Peter says, yes, he pays the temple tax, he goes to him and says, from whom do the sons take toll from, or to whom do the kings take toll from their uh, subjects or from the sons? Subjects, so the sons are free. But that we won't give them offense. Go and throw a hook into the lake and you'll find a fish. And in its mouth you'll find twice the temple tax. Go pay it for you and me. Jesus nowhere says, okay, you know, you messed up, so I'll just kind of give in. It's like, no, you messed up. This is the truth. It's interesting that this is the one place. And he gives, pays twice the temple tax for Peter, who's going to be his vicar, the vicar of Christ, leader of the church, leader of the, the new leader of the kingdom on earth, and him. Because there's this union there, there's this closeness. So we'll talk more about that later. And then, of course, all this leads up then to the Last Supper. In the Last Supper, we see, we see Jesus saying radically intense things, doing radically intense things. And one of the most intense things he's ever said, he ever said was, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Again, that's either claiming to be God or is blasphemy. If I said to you, if you've seen me, you've seen God. Wow, you should leave. <laughs> like, I'm, I've either lost it, or, uh, well, I've just lost it. There's no other options. <laughs> you know, lost it by going to megalomania crazy land or lost it by going crazy. He, angel can't say that. You see me, you've seen God. You see me, you've seen the Father. No. He says, you see me, you've seen the... He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe I am the Father? I am in the Father and the Father is in me. He doesn't claim to be the Father. It's important for... Uh, for understanding of God, doesn't claim to be the Father, but he claims to be one with the Father. If you've seen him, you've seen the Father, which is where we get this whole reality of him claiming to be God. And we know that this, this Jesus didn't come to establish some type of earthly superpower of, okay, we're going to drive out the Romans, we're going to have our nice castles. What did he come to do? He came 
to establish a kingdom, to bring the gospel, and to suffer and die for our salvation. And he was betrayed by one of his own apostles, by one of the people who should have known him the best, rejected him. Someone who saw miracles, saw him raise people from the dead, right? People will say this, you know, at times they'll say, I want to see a miracle. If I see a miracle, I'll believe. Maybe, maybe you won't. There's people who saw lots of miracles and who said, crucify him. There's people who saw miracles and Judas maybe even worked miracles and still betrayed him. And Jesus allowed it. He could have said, you know what, you want to crucify me? Well, yeah, by the way, I'm God. End to the human race. Gone. Cease to exist. You want to do what? No more humans. He says, but all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled, that all the disciples forsook him and fled. And he'd been prophesying about this. God had been prophesying about this for century after century after century. And Jesus recognizes this. This is taking place so that the scriptures can be fulfilled. And yet they still left him. They still forsook him. And we know that he was handed over first to the Jewish leaders, his own people, and the people who should have welcomed him. They rejected him, took him to Pontius Pilate to be condemned to death. He was viciously, violently scourged. Um, flesh ripped off his back. I mean, it's so, so amazing, right? He could have been. In, I just think, I think about this. I think about this when I think about the, the passion, the suffering of Christ. He could have ended the universe with a single act of the will at any moment. I'm done with you, right? If I, if someone was torturing you and all it took was a single thought for them to stop, it'd be pretty easy to be like thought given. You know, <laughs> I'm going to make you stop. Right? Boom. Cease to exist. And yet every single moment he didn't. He could have, he could have summoned a legion of angels, but he didn't. But why? We know that the cross is placed upon him. He carries it up to Calvary. I love this, this little image of Veronica. Veronica's not a person we hear about in the scriptures, but it's someone who we, we believe was there from, from uh, tradition, who uh, received the imprint of Christ. This, this mo- great moment of consolation where she wipes the face of Jesus. Such a beautiful thing, right? That she can't stop the cross from happening, and, and, but she can love Jesus in the midst of it. She can pour out compassion and love on Jesus. So beautiful. Real image of the spiritual life. What do we want to do? We want to be there. We want to pour out love. And what does he say from the cross? He enters into the depths of our suffering. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is actually a psalm. One of the ways you can point people to this prophecy in Psalm 22 is by quoting the first line. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's not like Jesus is despairing. God's given up on me. He's quoting a scripture. And that scripture is the scripture that has, they pierced my hands and feet. <laughs> you know? He's quoting a scripture. He's, and, and he's entering into the depths of our feeling of abandonment. He's taking on the depths of our sin. And in the midst of all that suffering, all that torture, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He prays for us. He asks for our forgiveness. He says to the good thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. At the very, you know, even to the end, trying to save souls, even to the end, trying to save a person who was, admits he's condemned justly, he's guilty. Remember me when you enter into your kingdom, today you'll be with me in paradise. And he offers himself to the Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Offers the blessed mother to us, woman, behold your son, Behold your mother. I thirst. Right? We can hear that thirst echo all throughout time. Right? He, what does he thirst for? It wasn't just because he was thirsty. Why did he say he thirsts for you? You. He thirsts for you. Your love. He thirsts for your heart. He came to earth to save us. He thirsts for you. He wasn't just, I'm going to do all this, so you know, write some pictures and make some books and tell some stories. He thirsts for you. He can't replace you. Doesn't want to lose you. Doesn't want to be separated from you all for all eternity. And if he's got to suffer an immense torture and literally go to hell and back for you, he would. He did. 
And at the last moments of his last breath, he cries out, it is finished. He offers an infinite act of love to the Father, taking on the depths of our sin, taking on all the suffering, a suffering we can't even imagine, right? Our sin desensitizes us to suffering. He's sinless. He's the most sensitized. He would have felt everything far more than we do. And yet he offers, in your hands I commend my spirit, it is finished. In a loud cry, he breathes his last. So, who, who do you say that? Uh, is that real? Did that happen? If it did, it changes everything. If this happened, it changes everything. And we cannot be indifferent to this. this is, we, we believe that someone died for you. You've got to respond to that. This is the person who did this for you. Not just 2,000 years ago, he did it for you and me. And you and I have to respond to that. I can't just be like, that's a nice story. No. You. <laughs> like, what are you going to say to Jesus? You're going to say, uh, that's great, but I didn't ask you to do that. Of course you didn't. You didn't exist. But did, he, did you need him to do it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What do you do it out of love? Yeah. Not because we're so great, but because he's so good and we are so lost. Because he's our only hope. We have turned away from God. We don't treat God like he, does, like he deserves to be treated. And so what does he do? He comes to us. God comes to us. And the, the, the real tragedy, of course, is what do we do? God comes to earth and what do we do? We viciously murder him. The God, the God who created the universe, the perfect one, he works miracles, he heals the sick, raises the dead, says the truth, and we say, crucify him. Yeah, kill this guy. Wow, how tragic. And so what are we, what are we going to say now to him? We say, eh, where's my cell phone? Eh, I don't feel like it. What are we going to say? I believe Thank you. I want to live for you. Because you lived for me. Are you loved this much? The God who created us just kind of say, oh, look at their life. It's sad. Or do we have a God who actually take, took our suffering, actually knows what it's like to suffer, actually knows what it's like to be persecuted and rejected and and hated, and, and thought all sorts of evil things. A God who has united himself to our suffering, so that we can unite ourselves to him, even in the midst of our suffering. And a God who has risen from the dead. All right, that wasn't it. The, the grave wasn't the end of the story. Right? This is the radical claim that even though we crucified him, he didn't stay dead. He came back to life three days later, rose from the dead. And even when his own apostles wouldn't believe it, right? put, your, put out your hand and place it in my side. And do not be faithless, but believing. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Jesus' mission was to reveal and glorify the Father and do his will. To fulfill all that had been foretold about the prophets. To establish the kingdom of God. He says, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is in your midst. Of course, we call it the Catholic Church today. Establish a new and everlasting covenant in his blood to redeem humanity from everlasting death and open the gates of heaven by dying for our sins. To offer infinite love to the Father. I, one, of my, my, one of my favorite lines in Scripture, because it's uh, maybe so underappreciated, is he says, I do as the Father has commanded me, What's the number one reason he does this? What's the number one reason he dies for us? What's the number one reason he does anything? That the world may know that I love the Father. I love it. So what place in Scripture where he just gives vent? I love the Father. That's who he is. Jesus pours himself out to the, to the Father for us. For the Father, his own sake, of course. And to send the Holy Spirit into our hearts. That we may call God Father. That we actually can share in his sonship. We can actually be so united with God... But we can share in the very sonship of Jesus, that Jesus grafts us onto himself like a vine and the branches. I am the vine, you are the branches. 
can abide in him, and he can abide in us. So we can call God Father like he does. So is Jesus of Nazareth God? Yes, this is the claim. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, without him was not, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And we have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the, fa- from the Father, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word became flesh, right? Jesus is called the Word of God. In John 10, I and the Father are one. We see the Jews answered him, it's not for a good work that we stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God, right? They understood the claim. And before that, in John's Gospel, he says, your father Abraham rejoiced that he was to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And the Jews answered him, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. Abraham was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before this. Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. (coughs) So he took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. He actually claimed the divine name. When God spoke to Moses, Moses said, well, who am I supposed to say? God said to him, I am who I am. I am Yahweh, the divine name. And he says it. Before Abraham existed, I am. And they're not like, what are you saying? No, they knew he was saying, he's like, this is either truth or blasphemy and we should kill you. We should either fall down and worship you or kill you. One or the other. John 14. He was seeing me as seeing the Father. I said that. Angel can't claim that. Colossians 2.9, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. God, in a body. In Hebrews, he reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe by his word of power. This isn't just some creature. This is the one who holds up the universe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And how will we answer him? Right? There's only three options. We know Jesus really existed. We can prove that. All the evidence shows that. It would be irrational not to believe that. And we know that he claimed to be God. And his disciples backed it up. Yes, he's claiming to be God. Even non-Christians are like, yeah, they think he's God. So there's only three options anytime someone says something. Either they're lying, gone crazy, or telling the truth. Right? If I say to you, I'm 42, that's either true or false. And I either, if I think it's true and it's false then I'm crazy, right? Or if I think it's, I know it's false, and I'm saying it's true, then I'm a liar. It is true, I am 42, but... Um, so, we look at, so we look at the claims, we just look, rationally. Okay, why would someone lie to get crucified? Well, they wouldn't, right? Because you die, that's it. You don't benefit from your lie, so why would you lie to die? Right? You don't. You lie to not die. No, lying's bad. People would lie to get out of trouble. People would lie to get stuff that they don't deserve to get. No, he's, if he would, it didn't make sense to lie. Okay, well, maybe he was crazy. That doesn't make sense with all the stuff. Even non-Christians are going to say that Jesus is the most influential person in human history. Had the most profound teachings, his, his, his uh, sermons, his teachings, brought together all the scriptures. This person is not some random crazy person. I don't know if you've ever met someone who actually has mental illness at the level that thinks they're God. Um, I have. And it's, it was very clear to me, very quickly, that it was not making sense. I remember I went to go visit a parishioner who was in a mental institution. Uh, and, uh, and as I walked up, this guy comes up to me, he's like, dude, dude, I need your help, we gotta talk to you. And he goes through this whole thing about how he needs my help because the government's keeping his money, keeping money from him, and he's really a prince in Egypt, and... It, then he goes into, oh, my, my parents are like Ra and I think it's Osiris or Isis, or I can't remember who the female Egyptian god is, and I'm a god. He just says, I'm a god. I was like, well, then why do you need my help? Like, how can the, if you're a god, how could the government? Like, it, it became very clear that one, he wasn't tracking, like, he wasn't making sense, he wasn't logical. And two, it became really, really clear, you know, that. 
typically with people who have that delusion that they're God, they're very narcissistic, very focused on themselves. Would, would any rational person call Jesus a narcissist? No. His whole life is for others. His whole life is being lived for others. And, of course, what do we have as an evidence in support of him? Prophecies, miracles, resurrection, eyewitness testimony. People are like, yeah, I stuck my finger in his side after I saw him buried and dead. He rose again. I saw him walk through the wall. And they were willing to be tortured and killed for that. That backs up his claim. All the evidence points to it. Now, we'll talk a lot more about this, but I want to talk just briefly about, okay, who is Jesus Christ? How can Jesus be both, he claims to be God, but then he says he's the Son of God. So how does that work, right? How can Jesus be both God and the Son of God? And this is the mystery of the Holy Trinity, that God reveals, that Jesus reveals that God is a trinity of persons in unity. One God and three divine persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the Christian revelation of, to the world, who God is in his inner life. Not just that there's one all-powerful God, we can know that just by reason, but that who he is in himself is Three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not three distinct gods, not some type of three-headed being, you know, but one God in three persons. We'll talk a whole lot about that. It's the greatest mystery in existence, the mystery of the Trinity. But it's not irrational. It's not like saying three equals one, or one plus one plus one equals one, because there's a distinction between nature and person, between who you are and what you are. Right? What am I? Human. Who am I? Father, man. Those two go together, but they're not the same thing. Right? What I am refers to my nature. I'm a human being. You're a human being. Right? Are we the same person? No, we're different persons. Now, there's lots of ways to be humans. Right? There's boy humans and girl humans. There's 42-year-old humans and 22-year-old humans. There's humans with, with brown hair. There's humans with white hair. There's humans with no hair. There's, there's lots of ways to be human. Right? I would say in philosophy, lots of ways to individuate that nature. Individual instances, separated instances of that nature. But obviously with God, there's only one nature, infinite. There's only one way to be infinite, and that's to be infinite. So there's one nature. If I go to God and say, what are you? He's going to say, God, infinite, all-powerful, creator of the universe. I go to God and say, who are you? He's not going to give the same answer. He's going to say, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I know we're just kind of tipping, touching the tip of the iceberg on that. We're going to have a whole class on the Trinity and that revelation and all that. But this is where we... You get Jesus both claiming to be the Son of God and claiming to be God. He claims to be the second person of the Trinity, doesn't claim to be the Father, but claims to be one with the Father. Claims to, if you see him, you see, you've seen the Father, because they have the same nature, one nature, one divine intellect, one divine will. Okay. Yeah, that's the biggest mystery of history and I just in existence, and I just summed it up in four minutes. So we got a whole lot more to say about that, but I just want to put that out there to kind of simmer. You know, a little, put it on the burner to stew for next week. So with Jesus Christ, who is Jesus Christ? He is the eternal Son of God, a divine person, with a divine nature and a human nature. He's one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, his divine nature, same divine intellect as the Father and Holy Spirit, same divine will as the Father and Holy Spirit. But he has taken on a human nature, a human body and a human soul. He didn't appear as a ghost, he took on a human body and a human soul. Is he a human person? No. He's a divine person. You know? He's not two people. A person is the subject of a rational nature. He's a, he, the I that Jesus is, the I, the subject, I, is divine. It's a divine I. It's a divine subject. But he's true God and true man. And we see this. You'll hear this in the Creed. And this is what Catholics were wrestling with, trying to come up with terms, and trying to get very precise, to not, to not get it wrong, you know, to get it right of who God is. What's been revealed, the greatest thing that could ever be revealed, who God is in his inner life, his innermost secret, uh, as the Catechism says. And you'll hear this, we pray, we pray this in the Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, uh, of all, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. I believe in one, one oh, I'm blanking. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only, it's a little dyslexic moment. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Right? Jesus, the eternal Son of God, did not, was not created. He always was, always is, always will be. He's eternal with the Father. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. 
again, I'm just putting this out there for it to kind of stew and simmer. Uh, we're going to have a whole class on that. And I put this little diagram out there that you can look over. Um, so the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost is God. But they're distinct. The Father's not the Son. The Son's not the Holy Spirit. The Son was made incarnate in the, in the most pure womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, took out a human body and a human soul through the power and action of the Holy Spirit. His name, Jesus Christ, is true God. One divine person, two natures, human and divine. He was true man and remained true God. He suffered and died as man because, he can, because as God, he can neither suffer and die. This is beautiful. But to save us, God didn't send an angel. God came himself. That we can rightly say God loved you so much that he, was, that he died for you. He gave his life for you. What does this all mean? Jesus reveals God is and what God is like. He has seen me and seen the Father. Jesus reveals how much we're worth to God. I love this line. You know that you were ransomed from your futile ways you inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things such as gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. You are worth the blood of Christ. You are worth the blood of Christ. People can say, oh, I'd climb a mountain for you, I'd, run, I'd swim the ocean for you, whatever, dude. Jesus has actually gone to hell and back for you. Literally. It happened. Conquered death for you. That's your price tag, right? I like it when people wear crucifixes. Or, you know, crosses too, it's fine. It's like they're wearing their price tag, right? What am I worth? It ain't five ninety nine. dollars It ain't movie and fries. Blood of Jesus Christ. Death of God. Right? That's what he sees you as worth. That's valuable. That's life-changing. Right? We accept that. You think, do I believe that I'm actually worth dying for? Not because I'm such a great person, but because I exist. It's not like God looked at you and said, oh, you're such a morally nice person. Oh, no, he said, bef bef while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's, that's because, we ex because we're made in his image. We're precious and valuable. Not because of how morally great we are. We should be morally great. That's not why. <laughs> it's because that we exist. You're made in his image. You're precious to him. You believe that, it changes. You look in the mirror and actually believe that. I believe that God loved me so much that he actually died for me, actually has conquered death for me, wants to wed himself to my soul, wants to marry me, wants to spend eternity in a union so deep and so profound. And I can experience that now in Jesus Christ. I can have that now living in my soul through sanctifying grace. I can actually be one with him. He can actually dwell in me. The being Catholic isn't just, okay, be nice, go to church, help the poor. You know, it's have God in your soul. Receive his love, abide in his love. Pour out your love to him. Receive that eternal life in him now. Experience his grace now. It's life-changing. Jesus makes it possible to be alive now and forever. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And we have to respond. We have to give our lives to him who lived and died for us. That God loves you this much. He was born in a manger. Loves you this much that he established a kingdom for you. Loves you this much that he pours himself out in the Eucharist, which we'll talk about. Loves you so much that he dies for you. Conquers death for you. How will we respond to this great love? My encouragement today would be, of course, to respond with, I love you too, Jesus. <laughs> I want to live for you. I want to give everything to you. Which is something we should do as Catholics every day. We talk in our prayer, we talk about, I talked about this on Sunday, in our prayer, in our more time in prayer in the morning, the first thing we should do is offer our lives to God every day. Lord, I give you my life, I give you this day, I give you all my prayers, works, joys, sufferings, all, everything. I give you everything to you. I just want to live for you you're good and worthy and holy and you love me. You know, it's the, it's the primary goal of our life. Union with God himself. Right? Not just, like, okay, there's a great drawing tonight, right? Powerball. $1.6 billion. Buh. whoop de doo I could spend that in a year. I could spend that about a month, actually. A lot of charities I'd love to help out. Actually, you have to spend $233 Oh, really? Okay. There's restriction there's legal restrictions on how much no, you can spend. Just the math. Oh. No, I could spend I could spend one point six billion in, in No, two hundred and thirty three million. Well if you take a lump sum. 
90, anyway, okay. <laughs> cut that out. Yes. Right. The point is, that's nothing. What do you do? What's going to happen when you die? You can't take it with you. There's no, you know, there's no U-Hauls following a hearse, right? What do you do? You, you may have lived as a billionaire, but you're going to die like everybody else with nothing. So if the meaning of life is to be a billionaire, I'm sorry, that's pathetic. That's sad. If the meaning of life is to be rich, that seems super depressing to me. How about the meaning of life is infinite love? How about the meaning of life is having union with an infinite being? How about the meaning of life is to see God as he is, to receive his love and his presence, and to pour myself out? That sounds a whole lot better, man. I don't, that sounds a whole lot better. So, um, uh, now, uh, we're over time is, again, and I'm, I'm, uh, I want to talk just kind of briefly, if you'll allow me, maybe, please, uh, a couple minutes to talk about something cool called the Shroud of Turin. If you've never heard of the Shroud of Turin, uh, now this is not something Catholics are required to believe to become Catholic. I personally believe it and think it's awesome, and all the evidence, I think, supports it. But, again, it's not, you got to believe the Holy Trinity to be Catholic. you got to believe Jesus Christ is God to be Catholic. You don't believe in the Shroud of Turin, Jesus will still love you. But, you know, you're, you're missing out. I think it's awesome. So, this is believed, it's in Turin, Italy, the cathedral of Turin, Italy. And it's believed to be the cloth that Jesus was buried in, which is referenced in the scriptures. Uh, the caught fire, so you can see little scorch marks in the 1500s, but it's currently in the cathedral in Turin, Italy, is on display every so often. And, it's, and there's lots of evidence that shows that this is an item from the first century, miraculous thing. Uh, one is its length, eight cubits by two cubits, which is a biblical or um, first century uh, measuring length. Two is, scientists cannot explain today how this image is on there. They cannot reproduce it, how the image is on the shroud, not just on the surface of the fibers, it's not painted, or it's just on the surface of the fibers, on the very tips. It's not painted, not scorched from heat. Some scientists hypothesize that a form of radiation by light could produce that image at a level that we cannot, but it's at a level that we cannot currently duplicate. We, Two thousand years later, we we don't have the ability to come up with that level of radiation. The blood on the shroud is type AB. When they study the blood, uh, so there's an image on the shroud, and then there's of course blood stains uh, that can, it contains a high concentration of bilirubin which is consistent with someone dying under great stress. Man in the cloth is five foot ten inches tall. And there's scourge marks on the cloth consistent with a Roman flag. And so this is one half of the shroud. Now it's hard to see the image, of course. Uh, you can go online and see it better. Stitching pattern on the shroud it has a herringbone weave, which is consistent with Jewish cloths in the first century. And you can see the image of the face here. With the crown of thorns, the hands, the blood, the wounded side. Of course, these are the, the burn marks and the blood stain on the feet. But when they took, when the photography came out and they took a photograph of the shroud and they developed the negative, they realized that the image came out much more profoundly. Uh, and you can start to, of course, it becomes, it jumps out at you. All the scourge marks all over his back. Massive amounts of scourge marks over his back and over the front of his body. And of course, the face is what really jumps out. Uh, the blood stains, when they studied it, the blood stains were applied before the image. Cotton is a Middle Eastern species not found in Europe. Pollens on the shroud are native to Jerusalem. Now, there was a carbon 14 dating that said, oh, see, it's a medieval forgery. But that was actually proven so by not just other scientists, but even scientists who worked on it. But that carbon-14 dating was, um, was contaminated by that they were using fibers, not only from the corners that would have had people touching it, they were lifting it up, but fibers used to repair the shroud after the fire. In 2013, they did a chemical test to date the shroud, and it dated to the first century. Photographic negative, and the photographic negative even reveals like this three-dimensional image, almost like someone passed through the shroud. It's... Um, go through, there's a shroud center in uh, Colorado Springs, and the guy go through all the details of the stuff in the shroud. 
And so that was a big statement, a big thing. Like, okay, we have this image of, G of this person, it could be Jesus. Scientists don't know how it's there. Everything <coughs> points to it that it's miraculous, that's not able to be re reproduced. <coughs> Is this the face of Christ? Quite possibly. I believe it. It is. So, for more information, obviously read the Bible. <laughs> I would encourage you. <laughs> I would encourage you if you have not read through one of the Gospels, this would be a great time to start. That was life changing for me. When I was listening to the Gospels on tape, and you can download apps, um, you know, audio Bibles, uh, theology for beginners, Jesus Shock by Dr. Frank Sheen, Case for the Case for Jesus by Brad, Pet Brad Petrie, Life of Christ by Archbishop Fulton Sheen, one of my heroes who want to go through the whole life of Christ in detail. Uh, the Shroud of Turin, there's actually an app you can download and kind of zoom in and, and see the Shroud and see the negative, which is pretty amazing. So we don't have time for small group discussions. I'm sorry. It's my favorite subject, so I hope you can understand why we went longer than normal. I'll try to do better next time. Um, I don't see any questions on the table. Were there any questions that you had? Yes. Um, this diagram that you have of the Trinity in that's in here, uh -huh. would it be possible to get a blow up of that? We will. And it might, would it be on next week? Since It'll I be in two weeks when we talk about the Trinity. Okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, we will. We'll go through that. There'll be a big blow up okay. of the image. It'd yeah. be a lot easier. Of course. Yeah. So, like I was saying, I tried to whet your appetite. Yes, you did. And let it simmer. <laughs> You know, because it's the biggest mystery in ever, and I want your head to explode when we talk about it. No. <laughs> yeah. So we're just going to put it out there a little bit. So, okay. Well, how about we close in prayer? And uh, you could say a prayer that I do better at wrapping up sooner so we can have time to discuss and we make our 815 deadline. So, I'm sorry. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for creating us. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. Lord Jesus, help us to believe. Help us to experience your love, your great unconditional love which can satisfy the depths of our hearts. Help us to experience your thirst for our love, your desire to, to give us life, your desire to save us from our sins, your desire to restore us, to heal us, and your desire for us to love you with all our hearts and strength. I ask all this through Christ our Lord. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks so much for being here, guys. Have a good night. God bless you.